Hello, welcome. I'm Jenny Gibbs, Executive Director of the IFPDA and the IFPDA Foundation, and this is Print Love. Uh, today we have the second program with our friends at the Drawing Foundation uh, with Christina Martinez and Antoine Gallet uh, with a program that will be moderated by Allison Wusher. Um, before we begin, just a, a reminder that the, we are recording today, and if you need to leave us early, you'll be able to find this on our YouTube channel uh, in the coming weeks. And if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A. And we very much hope to see you next week as well for the third week of webinars. Uh, next week on Tuesday, we have our first program, our first partnership with the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian. Uh, and then on Wednesday, we have Print Study Day with the Met, uh, which, is, which is always a highlight. Um, so with that, I'm very happy to turn this over to Allison. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. And thank you to IFPDA for hosting us today. Uh, we appreciate all the assistance you and your team have offered to get everything organized for us. Uh, my name is Allison Wisher. I'm the co-founder of the Drawing Foundation, a newly established nonprofit focused on developing and promoting events related to drawings. And this event today is our second event as the Drawing Foundation, and um, we're working on launching our website at the moment. So please do go to thedrawingfoundation.org to sign up for our mailing list and hear news about upcoming events and happenings. Uh, this event today is a collaboration between IFPDA and Master Drawings New York. Uh, it is the second event in a, in a series of events um, that we're doing with Master Drawings New York and IFPDA. The last one was on Thursday last week, and the next one is on Saturday, October 28th uh, at IFPDA Art Fair. Um, and all the information of, about these events will be available on the IFPDA website. Now, the event today brings together two international scholars whose research relates to both drawings and prints. Our first presenter, Antoine Gallet, holds a PhD in art history and the history of science and is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Geneva. His research focuses on the status of practices of the status and practices of draftsmen and printmakers in old regime France. His talk today is entitled Sebastian Leclerc and the value of preparatory drawings for prints and early interest in artistic process. His presentation discusses the artistic practices and reception of the celebrated printmaker, Sebastian Leclerc. Our second presenter is Christina S. Martinez. She holds a PhD in art history and is an interdisciplinary art historian, currently teaching at the Ottawa University in the Department of Visual Arts. Uh, she recently co-edited the, pu the publication, Female Printmakers, Print Sellers, and Pim Print Publishers in the 18th Century, The Imprint of Women, 1700 to 1830 which is due to be released early next year. Her scholarship focuses on 18th century British art and the work of William Hogarth, the history of copyright law and artistic practice, practices of appropriation. Her talk today is entitled, Read the Fine Print, published as the Act Directs by Jane Hogarth. The presentation discusses the implication of prints that were published by Jane Hogarth from drawings made by her late husband, William Hogarth. After Antoine and Christina complete their presentations, we'll have a short conversation about their research. At this time, we will also answer any questions that come up uh, from the viewers, so please do put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can put questions in there at any point during the presentations today, and we will get to them at the end of the presentations. Uh, now, without any further ado, I will introduce our first presenter, Antoine Gallet. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Alison, for the, the kind introduction. Thanks also to Jenny Gibbs and Michelle Stanek for the wonderful organization of this series of, of webinars. Nowadays, it seems obvious that drawings are valuable and deserve to be admired, studied and collected, but this was not always the case. It is the result of a slow and lengthy process during which the values ascribed to drawings progressively changed. One of the most famous early drawing collectors is undoubtedly Giorgio Vasari. When Vasari began to collect drawings in the mid 16th century, it was mostly because those could offer a synoptic view of the artist's different styles, helping him, helping him write his famous lives of the most excellent painters, sculptors, and architects. Vasari's motivation was thus quite pragmatic. Indeed, a large collection of drawings was much easier to gather than paintings themselves. To some extent, it was partly because of their availability that drawings began to be collected. They were cheaper substitutes for paintings. Of course, it does not mean drawings could not have been appreciated for themselves. It just means the high availability of drawings was a major incentive, at least until the end of the 17th century. 
At this time, the French art theoretician Roger de Pille still used this argument to justify the amateur's interest in drawing. But then, significantly, de Pille adds another much more original argument. He explained that in drawings, the work that we see is all spirit. Drawings are more indicative of the master's character and show whether, this, whether his genius is lively or heavy, whether his thoughts are lofty or common, and finally, whether he has a good habit and a good taste of all the parts that can be expressed on paper. A painter who wants to finish a painting tries to get out of himself, so to speak, in order to attract the praise given to the parts he feels he has been deprived of. But by making a drawing, he abandons himself to his genius and shows himself as he is. At this time, the expression of the individual the idiosyncratic genius of the artist begins to constitute a proper artistic value. Because drawings were supposedly the result of less constraint from the artist, they became considered as the most direct expression of the letter, and as such, they became valued for themselves as autonomous objects and not just as substitutes for painting. In France, the artist who best exemplifies this trend is Raymond Lafage, uh, who died in 1684 at only 28. Lafage quickly began to produce drawings only, and those became highly sought after for themselves because of their inventiveness and their liveliness. Many of these drawings were then engraved, next, and we can notice the desire to keep the liveliness and swiftness of the drawn line. In this case, the drawing is no longer an intermediate step toward the final artwork, but the final artwork itself, which is then reproduced through engraving, as a painting would be. While Lafage is a good indicator that a new taste for drawings was rising during the second half of the 17th century, he is, at the same time, an exceedingly peculiar figure. To appraise the phenomenon in a more general and more nuanced way, another indicator hitherto widely neglected is the moment when amateurs begin to collect preparatory drawings for prints. Indeed, since drawings were necessarily much scarcer than prints, it means that at this point, contrary to Vasari and his followers, amateurs did not collect drawings anymore because of their higher availability, sorry, availability, but because they developed a specific taste for this kind of objects. The case of Sébastien Leclerc's drawings offers a quite nuanced point of view. Leclerc is today quite little known, but from the late 17th century to the early 19th century, his prints were widely sought after, like Raimondi's, Carlos, or Rembrandt's pieces. Moreover, we know that he was closely acquainted with some of the most prominent print amateurs of his time, notably the Marquis Jacques Louis de Beringen, whose huge print collection is now in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Significantly, amateurs like Beringen not only wished to gather Leclerc's most beautiful prints, they wanted to have all of them, even the ugly small youth works uh, or similar prints later re-engraved. There's an example of two prints representing Saint Augustine preaching made 20 years apart, which have been gathered together by Beringen. This would have allowed him to compare the two prints and appraise Leclerc's artistic pro progress. With a similar purpose, amateurs even wanted to have impressions that show the changes Leclerc made on the same copper plate by gathering different states, such as these two impressions, next, where Hercules' legs has been corrected. In such cases, what amateurs wanted to get is a glimpse into Leclerc's artistic process itself. They were interested in his prints, not only because they were beautifully conceived and executed, but also because they could express something of the printmaker's genius. So we might wonder whether there was a similar trend with his drawings with a medium that was considered by De Peel at the very same time to be the most favorable uh, for the expression of genius. There is some evidence to support that Leclerc's drawings were already appreciated during his lifetime. Indeed, only a few years after his death, uh, one of his sons, Laurent Joss, wrote a biography of his father with a catalogue raisonné of his entire oeuvre. While the catalogue has remained unpublished, it is among the first known catalogue raisonné ever written, and it was certainly intended to be circulated and copied by amateurs. Significantly, it describes a few drawings, which attests that there was already some burgeoning interest in them. 
More interestingly, in another slightly later writing, Laurent Joss precisely describes the way his father invented his composition by using several drawings. I have seen my father work a hundred times. He threw his ideas on paper as if sketching. He then ruminated on his sketch and examined its effect at leisure. He retouched retouched it several times, and after various clean copies, in which he always changed a few things, he settled. This was when his taste made him feel that he had finally reached the point of beauty and perfection he was looking for. And indeed, we have several examples of Leclerc's way of multiplying drawings. The most remarkable one is for the print of the entry of Alexander into Babylon, next, for which at least Three different drawings are known, uh, next, from an early sketch to a much more finished drawing. And you can see the, very, the, the final drawing is very close to the print itself. To some extent, such a series of drawings could provide insight into Leclerc's artistic process, like the reunion of different states of the same print. The fact that Laurent-Jos Leclerc chose to provide information about the way his father used drawings might suggest an interest in this topic. So I will now investigate through a few examples to what extent Leclerc's drawings were already uh, sought after by his contemporaries and for which reasons they might have been appreciated. Ultimately, this will allow us to reflect on the way Leclerc might have been aware of the amateur's interest in his drawings and how he might have developed new artistic strategies to please them the same way Lafage did a few decades earlier. At first, what appears quite quickly when we get a broader view on Leclerc's drawn works is that almost all of the known drawings were clearly preparatory drawings for prints. He never made a series of autonomous drawings contrary to Lafage, who created a market for such works. Besides, what seems likely is that Leclerc kept most of his own drawings for later use, as can be demonstrated by the numerous elements that he reused in later prints. For example, some of the figures sketched in these two drawings of machines were used again for some later prints made for the Duke of Burgundy. It means that drawings, even preliminary sketches, needed to be kept for further use. This was obviously a very common practice among painters and printmakers at that time, but it should be stressed that this was incompatible with the development of drawing collecting, since the artist kept uh, all the drawings. In this view, drawings remain considered as tools and not as autonomous artworks that could be appreciated for themselves. However, there is another context in which Leclerc's drawings took a whole different function. In the 1670s and 1680s, Leclerc made some illustrations for a few manuscripts made for the king and other members of the royal family. As you know, illuminated manuscripts continued to be made during the 16th and 17th centuries, despite the huge development of printed books. Such volumes were usually luxury items, often made as prestigious gifts, and they often relied on specific visual conventions different from those of printed book. Uh, in the next slide, you can see a remarkable example um, during Louis XIV's reign, which is Jacques Bailly's devise pour les tapisseries du roi. However, in the case of manuscripts illustrated by Leclerc, the visual conventions are very close to those of printed books with the vignette and the letter. But what is especially interesting to us is that in terms of techniques, the only difference between these illustrations and most preparatory drawings is that the former are just a little bit more polished, a bit more finished. Illustrations such as those attest that, at least in this specific context, highly finished drawings could be considered complete artworks and appreciated for themselves. However, they were not exactly autonomous objects because their status as completed artworks was a priori connected to their specific environment, the manuscript book. One made us wonder if a drawing as finished as those would be valued the same way without this specific context. Interestingly, next, one of, the, one of Leclerc's most finished drawings has a very ambiguous status. It was never engraved, so we don't know whether it was a preparatory drawing for the small printed book of the Labyrinth of Versailles, next, or if it might have been a frontispiece for a manuscript version of the same book, but we don't know any trace, we have no trace of such a uh, manuscript book. However, although we don't know anything about its initial purpose, we have evidence that such a drawing was appreciated by Leclerc's contemporaries. 
At some point during Lockland's life, this drawing was bought by Claude Potier, one of the printmaker's most enthusiastic amateurs. Potier was mostly interested in Leclerc's prints, but he had also many drawings. Interestingly, several of them, including of course the drawing of the frontispiece here uh, in red in the next slide, are described in the sales catalogue as precious, very finished, of a beautiful finish, or made with great care. It suggests that Potier valued this kind of carefully finished drawing and that such drawings were still highly regarded in the mid 18th century when the catalogue was written. Of course, Potier also had less finished drawing, but it is difficult to know how he valued them. He had a nice preparatory drawing for one of the prints on the story of Psyche, a series that he had himself commissioned from Leclerc. In this case, we might wonder if one of the reasons Potier had this drawing was because he was attached to some extent to the project itself and that he wanted to have a trace of the process through which his prints had been made. We can find a similar attachment to a drawing in another contemporary print collector, Mathieu François Geoffroy. Geoffroy had a huge collection of prints by Leclerc, but only one single drawing. It was also a preparatory drawing for print that Geoffroy has himself had himself commissioned from Leclerc to decorate the thesis of his own son, Claude Joseph. This time, it was not engraved by Leclerc himself, but by one of his followers, Claude Duflo. Obviously, one of the reasons why Geoffroy had this single drawing in his collection was because of its attachment to the print itself, but it may be significant that Geoffroy did not own another preparatory drawing for the same print. This drawing is an earlier, much sketchier version, and with many differences from the print, such a drawing would later be considered a good way to gain some insight into Leclerc's artistic process. So this example suggests that Geoffroy, contrary to Potier, was not really interested in drawings, and especially not as a way to get a glimpse into Leclerc's genius. We may think that this drawing was an exception in his collection, not only because it was connected to an important event in Geoffroy's life, but also because it was exceedingly well finished. These few examples are not enough to draw definite conclusion, but they suggest that the interest in Leclerc's drawings was mostly in highly finished pieces, contrary to Lafarge's example, where the lifeliness and swiftness of the line was especially appreciated. This might be connected with the fact that such highly finished drawings could be more easily considered completed works completed artworks themselves, as suggested by the example of Leclerc's illustration for prestigious manuscripts. At this point, it should be stressed that the interest in Leclerc's highly finished drawings might have also contributed to express his genius. Indeed, Leclerc was generally praised for his intelligence, his knowledge of design, for the nobility and neatness of his style. In this respect, highly finished drawings would be quite consistent with the idea amateurs had of Leclerc's genius, the same way Lafarge's lively sketches were consistent with the impulsive and lively genius attributed to him. Now let's quickly try to understand how Leclerc might have taken advantage of some um, amateur's burgeoning interest in his drawings. Again, we have no evidence that he ever did um, highly finished drawings plan to be autonomous artworks. In fact, we know that he usually did highly finished drawings when he intended to delegate the engraving to one of his fellows printmaker, as it is the case for jo Geoffroy's thesis, or for this small uh, print in the next slide engraved by Franz Ertinger, or oh, it's the next. This was a way to ensure that the design would be closely reproduced. However, there is another phenomenon that is potentially interesting. At the very beginning of the 18th century, he began to produce a series of eight small prints about some of Louis XIV's major accomplishments. This series, known as the Small Conquest, remain uncompleted, but, the in, the, but sorry, in the amateur's mind, a ninth piece could be added. It was a preparatory drawing for ninth print representing the foundation of the Royal Observatory. The fact that only this drawing and not the other preparatory drawings for the existing prints was known meant that this drawing was ascribed a specific value despite being this time quite sketchy. It replaces to some extent a print that was never engraved. Similarly, Leclerc did two drawings at the end of his life that he never engraved. 
Here is probably, in the next slide, an earlier version of one of them. These drawings and their story are described in Leclerc's uh, biography by, written by his son a few years after his death. Leclerc made two very fine drawings of the same size as his academy. One is a passage uh, through the Red Sea and the other a descent into limbo. The undertaking was a little daunting for a man in his 70s, and so these drawings have remained as such, and it will be difficult to find an engraver capable of executing them. The mention of these preparatory drawings attests that amateurs could have been interested in them the same way they might have been interested in some of Leclerc's other drawings. But at this time, Leclerc was already quite old, and he had just completed his entry of Alexander into Babylon that I showed earlier, a huge work that took him uh, two or three years to achieve. So it seems, in fact, quite unlikely that Leclerc would have made these two drawings with the intention of engraving them. In this case, at the very end of his life, through his relationship with some amateurs, such as Potier, he might have recognized that drawings could be valued for themselves. Leclerc was certainly eager to pursue large composition, such as the entry of Alexander or his famous Academy of Science and Arts in the next slide. Because of the pleasure he might have in doing this kind of design and because of the success he met with them, but he might have realized, thanks to his um, to, thanks, sorry, to his amateur's interest in his drawn work, that it was not absolutely necessary to engrave them in order to meet with praise and recognition. Through this brief panorama of Leclerc's drawn works, I wanted first to underline the diversity and the diversity of the values that were ascribed to them. While Lafage's example strikingly supports the development of drawings as autonomous artworks in the late 17th century, the example of Leclerc's shows how complex this process might have been and how complex were the changing values ascribed to drawings at the turn of the 18th century. Thank you for your attention. Thank you um, for, to the IFPDA and everyone who is uh, taking time of their busy schedules to attend uh, this presentation, as well as uh, Antoine and uh, the, the organizers, uh, Michelle, Alison, and Jenny, uh, for the, organizing this, this wonderful event and making me part of it. Um, my short is uh, a bit different from uh, Antoine in the sense that I don't use uh, or focus as much in the drawings but as I am much uh, more interested in the uh, work of Jane Hogarth, I use the drawings as a means to explain what ensues with her productions. So my interest in Jane Hogarth began when I found a letter in the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale University, which actually was miscatalogued, but that I was able to retrieve with the help of the staff from the Louis Walpole Library, where I was a fellow, a visiting fellow. In, his, in her letter of 1781, Jane confronted the prominent bookseller, John Nichols, who had sent her the proof of his book written, written about her husband, the painter and engraver, William Hogarth. She was in her 70s, when in defense of her husband's reputation, as well as her own, she denounced John Nichols' biographical accounts and sources in critical and forceful words. And I quote, I beg you will accept my thanks for sending me the enclosed proof, which I have carefully perused. I'm sorry to say that through the whole work, misrepresentation and error abounds. It would require a book to refute all the mistakes that is contained in the work as well as catalog. I can only say, as it is not in my power to prevent such errors being published, it is entirely against my consent. After William's death in 1764, Jane took full control of her husband's print selling business and succeeded in continuing to sell Hogarth's reprints with a persistence that lasted a full quarter century. She states in her letter that her whole dependence is upon the sale of Mr. Hogarth's works. During her long and active career as a print seller, Jane strove to protect her husband's reputation, but she also resolved to safeguard her property, something she achieved through copyright law by obtaining a unique extension to the coverage period of her husband's prints. In 1735, 
The engraver's act would have been the result of Hogarth's efforts to prevent the piracy of his works, provided protection for a term of 14 years from the date of first publication, but this period had now elapsed. Jane, working in collaboration with the Society of Artists of Great Britain in putting a bill before Parliament intended to better secure the rights of artists. Her efforts paid off, and the 1767 Act conferred her the sole right and liberty of printing and reprinting all the said prints, etchings, and engravings of the design and invention of the said William Hogarth for and during the term of 20 years. My focus today is on Jane Hogarth's new prints and their dissemination. An analysis of select prints and their publication line will explore the various relationships that existed between parties involved in the creation of a print from an original work, often a drawing, and of the related copyright implications. Time does not allow for me to get into the specifics of the copyright acts. So for that, I invite you to consult my essay in my forthcoming book, Female Printmakers, Print Sellers, and Print Publishers, The Imprint of Women, co-edited with Cynthia Roman with Cambridge University Press. I first want to begin by stating that William Bogart, trained as a letter engraver, then became a painter and designer. He had invented, and I quote, a new way of proceeding painting and engraving modern moral subjects, a feel and broke up in any country or any age, end of quote. It is important to recognize that in the early 1730s, he was already thriving. And although the status of the engraving in England was low at the time, Hogarth had acquired a high reputation and his prints were expensive products sought after by wealthy buyers and people of fashion. The market for prints was changing. And as I will discuss in this short presentation, Jane played a large part in the Hogarth mania that ensued in the late 18th century. The demand for and popularity of Hogarth's prints provided an opportunity that Jane herself seized by offering new items for those desirous of expanding their collection. In 1775, she issued the politician from an original sketch of Hogarth with the engraver and etcher John Cage Sherwin. The print shows a man so focused in his reading that he does not notice that his candle is setting fire to his hat. The publication line reads, published as the art directs by Jane Hogarth, 1775. And this possibly constitutes the very first instance of Jane's name appearing directly on a print. 31 of October has been added in ink in what seems an attempt to comply with the formalities of the Engravers Act. Important requirements had to be met. Protection commenced from the day of the first publishing thereof, which shall be truly engraved with the name of the proprietor on each plate and printed on every such print or prints. The publication also mentions that the print had been etched from an original sketch in the possession of Mr. Forrest. Hogarth had presented the original to Theodosius Forrest, son of the lawyer and close friend of William Ebenezer Forrest. To use the language of the 1770, of the 1767 Act, Jane has caused it to be engraved, which means she hired the engraver and made the necessary arrangements because the act allowed a publisher who merely caused something to be engraved without taking any part in the creative process, she's the holder of the print's copyright. This was an important change from the 1735 act. She had to borrow the original from the owner and added his name in the publication line. William himself had used a similar convention in his work as is the case for his print from 1752, Paul before Felix, where he mentions that the work is engraved from his original picture in Lincoln's Inn Hall. I have been unable to locate the said sketch, but have found a work on oil, an oil on canvas in the in 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 the Cremain, in Crimea, and the existence of this painting is new to me, and I'm quite exactly, and currently investigating its provenance as well as the implications. Hogarth used paintings and drawings as the means to create his engravings, and even the paintings often become advertisements for the prints. Very few of his drawings actually survive. 
he often used this as sketches, as tools to work out his ideas that he would then transfer to the copper plate. Importantly, he did not copy them exactly as he worked them into the plate. The print was actually the end product and drawings did not have the value we were attributed to them now, an aspect that I'm currently investigating. With Jane's print, a whole subset ensued. Here, I'm showing various iterations which follows James Prince and supposed original sketch. A copy by John Henry Shares from 1798, a copy previously owned by the artist George Cruikshank from the British Museum, and we, we see the man oblivious and reading with the candle burning almost his hat, and the color copy from an illustrated almanac from 1882. And here we see the politician facing right as the print is reversed. It is a copy by the German engraver, Ernest Ludwig Riebenhausen, which were quite sought after. The dealer seen in this print today actually states that the German versions were often preferred to those by Hogarth himself. This is quite a claim. And this, my favorite, an adaptation, an etching from 1789, from the Welcome Collection, representing a seated politician, this time reading news of the French Revolution. The hat is now on the table, but his wig is now what catches fire. Notice that the hatchings for the shadows are also present. The newspaper reads, the gazetteer and N, by letters from Paris, we hear that the flame of liberty has broke out there with. Today, the copies have reached the distribution channels of Amazon, and I even have found an embroidery in any other websites, in one, another website. But my interest here, again, back to Jane, is on this print, which she published on 1st May, 1781, and it's a landscape, a print representing harvesting fields, homes with distinctive fences, and in the foreground, a seated man with his dog resting near a tree, where it's rather prominent and large font reads, published as the art directs by Jane Hogarth at the Golden Head Lister Fields, 1st May, 1781. It was formally attributed to William Hogarth, but as I have pointed out to curators of the British Museum, the print does not show who designed or etched it. It is not known if the print is taken from a drawing by Hogarth, and I'm puzzled as to why Jane has chosen not to reference his name at all. I wonder if the image had appealed simply because it showed the grounds at Chiswick. Although the publication lines need to be treated with caution, they often disclose important information revealing the holder of the copyright and different types of arrangements that a print seller or printmaker may have had as either proprietor or co-proprietor. Co this is the case for James' collaborative works with the painter and engraver Richard Lipsy, which I have come to name the non-Hogarth Hogarths. Looking, for example, at the engravings he made after Hogarth's drawings of his two of the themes at Midway, Estuaries with Ebenezer Forest, and others, the publication line in each of them includes his name only as proprietor and reads as follows. Published as the Act Directs, November 27, 1781, by Richard Lipsy at Mrs. Hogarth Lister Fields. This is again the case for Mr. Ben Reed and Mr. Gabriel Hunt, both also done after drawing set to be by Hogarth, published on 27 November 1781, and showing Lipsy as proprietor. The inscription at Mrs. Hogger, at Mrs. Hogger's Lister Fields corresponds to a time when Lipsy was a lodger at Jane's house, and he could have been producing and selling his prints there. It is unknown whether Lipsy was working as an employee for Jane, and the exact nature and time frame of their business arrangement remains unclear. Earlier, he had made works after Hogger's design, bearing his only name, as in Marx, as Marx and Palette, without mention of Mrs. Hogarth's address. As part of the new art offerings, Jane and Lipsy issued Shrimps, a print engraved by Francesco Bartolossi, after a painting by Hogarth, which was still in Jane's possession. It represents a joyful young woman with a breast peering through the fabric of her blouse 
a definite accentuation of Hogarth's more concealed version. Here, both Jane and Richard are appear as co-proprietors, and it is interesting that in a 1790 reissued copy of the print, the name of Richard Livesey has been scratched out by an unknown hand, indicating that to one of its owner, James Hogarth's name has a superior value. James Hythes of 1765, 67, and 68 are very similar. The prices and the order of the prints are mostly identical. James Prices of 1784 includes 10 new offerings, the most expensive being the landscape and the shrimp girl, and also listed are the politician, the heads from the cartoons, as well as a few subscription tickets, but those made by Lipsy, where only his names appear in the publication line, are not included. By offering prints after William's early sketches, never before available to the public, she was preserving and further disseminating his error. Hogarth, as David A. Brewer shows, quote, came to be regarded as part of the English national heritage and his graphic work became ingrained in English culture, second only to Shakespeare, end of quote. Jane continued the process of building this legacy by expanding William's offerings with her new additions. As, show in the, as shown in the, plaque, in the price list, she was selling existing prints, reprints, and new offerings of her husband's work. She went to great lengths to assure the public of her reputation and the quality of the plates, which were said to have lost much of its former clearness. Jane, however, reassured the public, and in an announcement that reads more like a certificate of authenticity than a newspaper advertisement, solicited the opinion of the celebrated Bartolossi, Woolett, and Wine Ryland, who publicly denied that the place had been retouched. Jane's motivation in publishing new items was also a strategic and clearly tied to commercial interests. The copyrights were soon expiring. Thus, the presentation of new works had appealed. There were, however, financial risks involved with bringing the prints to market. The procurement of prime, prime paper and good ink the careful preparation of plates, et cetera, was co costly components of the train, but she maintained a good network of allies, contacts, and suppliers in order to succeed. In conclusion, the works of Hogarth were noticed, copied, and adapted boy by his contemporaries a decades late, a, and decades later. Here, we can see the way in which the image of the shrimp girl goes from painting to print to copies and adaptations. Thomas Rawlinson, for example, produced a playful portrait of the shrimp seller facing left. And in his hot goose cabbage and cucumbers, the cheerful vendor is now turned in the other direction and with one breast accentuated, as was the case in the print issued by Jane and Lipsy. Isaac Cruikshank seems to have followed, to have also followed and borrowed the theme. Hogarth mania was setting foot and Jane's new offerings help fit its appetite. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Christina. And we invite anyone to put questions they might have in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And I wanted to start by asking if either of you have questions for each other you wanted to start with. Well, I I, I, I find it really fascinating. What I what, I, I have really a question, I, uh, but I, I'm making a lot of questions in my mind, but I will need uh, some time to rephrase uh, uh, to phrase them uh, but what i find really interesting is how i mean in more general uh ways how ogard is uh, i mean the figure of ogard is built uh, uh to some extent by his wife and this this kind of i mean the idea that you that the artist that you have to create uh, the figure of the artist, which is something that you really showed uh, well with with the, with Ogard. I mean, it's a fascinating uh, topic. So I have a lot of uh, different ideas, but too blur for the moment to 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 really um, tell them. But um, 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 I I I I wonder because I, I'm not very familiar to uh, to to with with Ogard, and I assume some of our audience may not be uh, as as familiar but are there other people of I, I wonder if will Walpole for example I mean contributed to making this kind of of uh 
um, how do we say, like fundamental figure. Uh, I mean, Hogarth is not in himself. I mean, he's important, of course, but there is the, all this process of making uh, uh, an illustrious uh, figure, or uh, and 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 Jane contributed to it, uh, and other people too. I, I'm wondering, and Hogarth himself, how do yeah. how did he perceive himself? And uh, yeah, yeah. Thank thank you, because I think that the main thing here is the the way in which it is a, a very short excerpt from, from my, my, my bigger piece on Jane Hogarth. And obviously there is this Hogarth mania that had initiated because uh, same to uh, Nichols, while Paul had written the anecdotes to which Jane opposed as well. And, and, but my point being is that there seems to be this, this synergy between our presentations in which the drawings or, or earlier works are preparatory um, in 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 its means at achieving the end result, which is a copper plate, and the print, which is the valued um, 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 work of art that is that is sought after, and 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 this is very new to me. I'm I'm starting to work with the drawings more. I have the, making the deliberate choice of not showing them because I did not want to take away from Jane. Um, but the, the 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 project that I'm that I'm trying to um, uh, really is to trace back all the drawings from which Lipsy may have inspired, but it appears that these may were not for sale. It was they were given by William Hogarth. Is is what I'm what I'm trying to to realize. But in a sense, what's what what I find important is in the way in which you treated the drawing as something that is a tool um, and that it acquires its value. And I think it's a modern conception that we may think. Uh, of the drawing as something that has an authentic value. That's a modern definition. I that's, would say that's a 20th century uh, creation. Yeah, we, we value the print rather than the drawing. The, ex except in some weird cases like Lafage, for example, where the, the, the I just show very quickly the, the, the print, but the, the engraving looks like, I mean, it's made to look like a drawing. And in the, in the late 18th century, for example, you find Bach uh, engraving um, making engravings after sketches by Rembrandt. They are very uh, famous. I mean, probably some of you have seen them. Um, so it's it's in, it's very interesting. I I I I think that with Hogarth, uh, this the 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 sketches, the preparatory um, I and mean, the preparatory drawings, the sketches uh, were transformed to look like a print, if I may say. Or uh, while for other examples like. Lafage or Rembrandt later, uh, we want engraving that looks like a drawing or something like that. And there is this phenomenon with the in France with the um, how do we say in French we say a uh, manière de crayon, uh, pencil manner, pencil style. Uh, so there is this kind of duality, and I I cannot really grasp why some why did Jane work like that, and why did for example Bach. Uh, or Terbogen with with uh, Lafage worked uh, in another way. What what? So so yeah. I I, I it's just I, I, I think there, is I, a, there is a mystery around the drawings of Hogarth, and there is only two uh, studies done about them. And I know colleagues that are currently and for which I own a lot of of of, of what what I'm saying. Um and 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 it, it's something to be e explored more and and. Uh, Again, it was a deliberate choice not to just kind of like add this mystery to them because Hogarth is 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 using them as tools, as I as I've said. And and what I find fascinating is that he's modifying is the plate. Uh, so so the process is something that uh, and how the end product is different from or the painting the the print and the and the the the, the painting slash the the drawing and the print are different from each other. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there was, um, for both of you, uh, I, you know, there was writing about the artist after their passing, both through Jane and through the son of Leclerc. And I'm wondering if in kind of the passing through of materials to the next generation, if they accounted for a number of drawings within that, was it like, you know, 500 sheets of drawings for prints or study drawings or things like that? How were they cataloged um, or treated as part of the estate? Was that something that came up? In the case of Jane, yes, Boydell and uh, Ireland, for example, acquired some, and then they, they use them as a means to create other prints. Um, but I think it's a very clever strategy from the part of Jane to create new offerings uh, because the copyrights were expiring. And in her case, I think it's also this, this sense of 
adding her name to the legacy. Um, and and, and, and in, in the sense, I'm interested in the way in which the status of a painter may evolve. What, what does it make of it? What, what does it mean that we have a painter of high status um, that has made it in England as a painter? He is a painter. But then in, in, the, in the later decades with Jane, something seems to have um, become more alive. And it seems to me that uh, Jane is in part responsible for, for a change in status or, or how we see or, or receive the, the, the reception of that artist. But I don't know, Antoine, in your case. Well, um, um, well, yeah, thank you for the, 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 the great, great information in, in what you said that I, I keep in mind too. Um, well, well, with Leclerc, I mean, there's a two, there is this kind of, this, this guy, Claude Potier, uh, which I talked about, um, who apparently had a lot of drawings. It's difficult to number because the catalogs are not always very clear about that. But what is interesting is that in the introduction of the catalog, which is obviously written not by Potier himself, but by the, the merchants that, that uh, were uh, selling uh, the, the whole collection, uh, which is like... Uh, uh, huge uh, it's a huge print and drawing collection uh with with, with a lot of uh, different artists pieces but um it's interesting that the the, the merchants told uh, in the introduction that potier had all of his drawings from leclerc himself so a way at the same time to make a connection between the amateur and the artist so to value the collection and also of course there's a question of authorship and the fact that it's it's the authenticity of the drawings are in this way um uh, assured uh, and there is another um uh, there is another uh, person which is the the leclerc one of leclerc's son who was a painter member of the academy royale uh, and uh, who had a lot of drawings from his father and it's here it's quite tricky because uh, he was also a collector, like a huge collector. Uh, so we don't really know uh, where these drawings are coming from. They can, I mean, they might have been later bought. Some of them were obviously uh, inherited, but some of them might have been later bought. So it's it's kind of a mystery uh, in uh, in uh, but uh, um, in 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 the way these these uh, these drawings were were um, uh, yeah. Um, the, yeah, transferred or, or uh, but uh, a lot of questions that that I will have to, to clarify. Yeah, uh, thank you. I had a question about, um, you mentioned that the first catalog resume of prints was Leclerc's, um, was that? It's not exactly true. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I, I think there is a, a an early catalog resume of uh, of Ogas work, right? Or, or um, but it's it, yeah. I, I mean, the, the, I'm interested in. I'm now interested. I'm becoming interested in the history of catalogs resume because I think there is uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon to understand how we value um, the artistic figure, the artistic genius, uh, uh, the mind of a singular person. Um, and um, there is um, an early catalogue of Raimondi's um, uh, prints, uh, which was made by a French uh, engraver Pierre Daret, published in 1651 with the translation of the of Vasari's biography of Raimondi but it's very sketchy what is what is it's it's not it doesn't want to be complete it's it's closer to a kind of list uh, that a merchant would do um, uh, in order to sell uh, to sell a, a part of the of his of his stock but um there, there, there are a few. I mean, it's the, it's, it's the first. Uh, we talk a lot about. I mean, people interested in the history of catalogues raisonnés uh, talk a lot about uh, how there should have been a manuscript catalogues raisonné uh, before uh, published catalogue raisonné, uh, and, uh, and the first, the, the, the thing which is considered the first catalogue raisonné is, is uh, Gersin's uh, catalogue of Rembrandt. Print, uh, even though there are earlier examples of of things that are put into books or, or I mean um, 
other kind of, of uh, smaller uh, catalogs that would be included into larger uh, books, for example, uh, Florent Lecomte's uh, book. But, but what I find very interesting is that this, what was the purpose of doing a manuscript catalog resume or, or, uh, or, um, or um, how did this kind of work circulated, how helpful it might have been uh, for amateurs. So there, there, there is a lot of question with, with catalog raisonné that I, I, I need to, that I need to, to um, and, um, yeah, enlighten, but, but uh, to explore. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's basically the first catalog raisonné that I know uh, as, as a single piece of work, even though it's manuscript, but, but it's, it's a very original with, with the precision, I mean, the dimensions, the size of the artworks are, are given. So it's it's very, very interesting in terms of, of the attention to the artwork. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, I'm, asked, I'm wondering if the audience has any questions um, or if you have any questions for each other. Otherwise, uh, we may wrap up the conversation. Um, anything else anyone wants to discuss? I, I think the question of, of the catalog is, is an important one and, and a delicate one because what, what constitutes a catalog? How do you define it? How is it different from a price list? And Nichols actually had had, had an attempt of creating the first catalog and he even attempts to um, input all the copies of the Hogarths and, and, and he stops doing it because it's, it's impossible, right? So it's this task, it's like a map, what's framed and what's, what's in it and what's excluded. Right, so uh, the, the questions of provenance, the questions of attribution, and um, and it's something that I'm that I'm definitely interested in exploring in the context of the drawings uh, as well as the paintings and and the prints. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, certainly yeah fa fascinating. Um, I I think it's one one of the very interesting things in in the example in one of the example you show uh, the, the the print of Gabriel Hunt. Uh, I mean in, in in regarding the question because there is a the, the whole question about uh, about catalog resonance is also about scholarship and the history of our disciplines so of course um and and uh, there is this question of the kind of information that we want in a catalog and the kind of information I was struck by the by the the example of the print of of uh, Gabriel Hunt where there is a level of precision that that we usually do not find in in prints published by this time I mean the the provenance is often the provenance of the drawing is often given for example with Cosa's collection or or, or or this kind of of stuff it's quite common but the the idea to put the date uh, when when the drawing was and it's about so it's not I mean it's not like it's really known it's a suggestion from from Jane probably uh, um, uh, so I mean it's a very informal it, it, it's 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 I think it's always very interesting why this kind of information uh, begins to be important to 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 those who published the print and to those, of course, who were supposedly uh, buying the print. So, so I think it's a, it's a fascinating example uh, of uh, something that become important and that wasn't uh, before because dating stuff are not, were not always important neither. Uh, so yeah. yeah. And, and, and the difference between uh, Britain and, and other countries, right? That we have the publication line, which is so informative, but we, treat, we need to treat with caution, right? Where it, it's so useful in terms of dating and um, and extra information that it wasn't a requirement, but even even the origins of the of the line pu published as the act directs. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you both so much for participating in the conversation today. It was wonderful to have your presentations and to learn more about both Leclerc and Jane Hogarth and their uh, contributions to both printmaking and drawing history. So thank you again for um, preparing those presentations for us. Yeah, thank you, Antoine and Christina. That was great. And thank you, Allison, uh, for organizing this program today. Um, we look forward to seeing everyone next week on Tuesday for a program presented by our friends at Print Council of America uh, with the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum exploring the De Clou collection. And then on Wednesday, we have Print Study Day with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. See you next week. <laughs>